Hi, I'm Nate Ryan, host of the NASCAR and NBC podcast. Every week, we're talking to drivers, crew chiefs, and other personalities in the NASCAR industry, as well as NBC Sports analysts like Steve Letarte, Kyle Petty, Dale Jarrett, and Jeff Burton. The conversations are always informative, insightful, and occasionally quite a bit lively, too. So give us a listen and subscribe to the NASCAR and NBC podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Leisure Leisureman Sunday Night Radio Show podcast. I'm Paul Paps. He's Andrew Perloff. Perloff, what's on deck tonight? Oh, we're going to talk a little World Cup. We're going to look back at last week's NBA draft and look ahead to next week's NBA free agency. And we have something coming up later, the, the Leisureman movie segment. We are going to look back at an all-time great comedy. I'm not going to give it an A+. Plus. I think I'm going to give it like an A-, minus, and I'm, a, I'm worried that you may lash out at me verbally. Oh, man. I can't wait to find out what this is, Paul. It, it, it's, I think... I think you're going to be mad, actually real mad at me, not radio mad, but really mad at me. Uh, I, that's the kind of thing that would make me angry at you. I'll hold a grudge <laughs> if you were, but you and I are usually pretty close on movies. So now I'm very curious to see where we're going to differ. Stick around and find out later. The Leaderman Podcast. You know the, t- the the good thing about the World Cup and the bad thing is it's morning and afternoons, which is usually the time mm. you're like running errands, doing things, going to the beach, whatever. You got to kind of plan your day to watch the World Cup. There's no night matches. Yeah, I like it on the weekend, though. I li- you know, it's similar to the Premier League. It's on Sunday, Saturday and Sunday morning. Right. So I'm totally down with that because on Saturday night, I don't really want a game. But I do wish there was a primetime game during the week, especially there's nothing except baseball going on. So I'm a little bummed during the week. And I, I, I found myself watching replays of matches that I watched in the afternoon, which is kind of cool, actually. It's great in the mornings. We work on the Dan Patrick show well, and we get in, and all of a sudden, eight oh five. Here comes here comes Sweden running out of the pit, onto the pitch. It's great. Let me give you my uh, my World Cup questions, Paul. You ready? Go ahead. Yep. Okay. Uh, so far, if you had to reseed the whole tournament and you were doing a pool, who would your number one seed be? That's a toughie. Um, teams that have played well, but are not my number one seed, include Croatia. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brazil has been good, but not Brazil-ish yet. Mexico Mm -hmm. has been over their skis, but they don't have the talent to be a one seed. England has played very well. Same, They do have the talent. It's a little young. Belgium has a truckload of talent. They've won two matches. Their goal differential is plus six. Uh, Belgium usually finds a way to hit the banana peel at some point. Um, Germany lost to Mexico, so by that, that doesn't take them out of the one seed prediction. I'm going to go with France. Uh, always deep. Um, not as many household names on the French team this time as in past years. But I would say if I were just taking a, if there was an open draft, I think I would take France. I think they haven't played their best, but they're they have a lot of tradition there, and they usually don't screw it up. If you know what I mean. How much they usually I, don't choke. How much did I read into the early results? Do teams tend to get hot in these early rounds and then carry into the final sixteen, or is it a reset? Say Brazil doesn't play great now. Will they turn it on once they get to the elimination round? Yeah, that's a good question because I think, obviously, the second-tier teams like Peru and Iceland and Costa Rica are battling to get into the next stage, the knockout round. And a team like Brazil, they started slow the other day, real slow. Yeah. But the, the level of talent with Costa Rica and Brazil, it's not even in the vicinity. There's not one, maybe one guy in Costa Rica could start for Brazil. So mm. I think some of these teams, though, get caught pacing themselves early. The powerhouses like Germany should mop up Mexico. Mexico is good. Germany's great. But Me- Mexico had one of the biggest wins in their country's history by beating Germany to open up the, the their World Cup run. Yeah, and then I think yesterday Germany scored a uh, second-half goal to keep their whole thing alive right. against Sweden. So uh, England, is it time for me to finally get excited for my – Buddy, the men in blazers, and the Team England, who I have in the Dan Patrick Show pool. I would buy your Harry Kane jersey. Now, prepare yes. yourself. If you're an, if you anyone out there is an England football fan, England soccer fan, they've been close before, and the rug usually gets pulled out. Google David Beckham World Cup, mm. and you'll find some good and some bad. But England is, is red hot right now. I, I, their fans are as fired up as they've been in probably 15 years. My wife informed me that the English soccer team was very attractive this morning, Paul. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with that? Hey, as always, Andrew, no matter if World Cup or no World Cup, do whatever your wife says. I'm Perloff. He's Paps. Talking a little NBA draft. We're a few days past it. Trying to figure out really what we saw because there's so many young players and there's so many sort of T 
teams are tanking all the time. We don't really know what we have there. But there's one theory that Paul and I have that I think we're going to stick with. In general, we talked about this earlier, avoid the hometown kids. So Philadelphia yeah. 76 Basically, don't. the theory is yeah. it, it, don't let the hometown factor into your drafting at all. Now, the Phoenix Suns took DeAndre Ayton, who's semi-local. He plays in Tucson, not Phoenix. and that's to- Those are two separate places. Even though it's in Arizona, he didn't play at ASU. He played at uh, University of Arizona. But a lot of people in the media said, what a perfect fit, DeAndre Ayton and the Suns. Man, I mean, if if, if they drafted uh, Jaron Jackson Jr., he would have become a Phoenix resident in about four hours after he was drafted. Yeah. It doesn't matter at all. Um, but then you go back to history, Perloff. Here's some of the bad ones. I'll, I'll go a good one. I guess it's a good one. 2008, number one pick of the draft, Derrick Rose, taken by the Chicago Bulls. He played high school on the south side. Went to Memphis one year. And for the first four years, five years of his career, Derrick Rose was legit. First four years, I mean, he was a superstar. So that worked out. But do you, did it work out? No, it certainly didn't work out. But Why other than injury. Was- yeah, nah, he had some off-the-court problems. Also, his game was very ball-dominant, not three-point. I'm not sure he would have really lasted into the Golden State era. He was sort of the last of a generation of put your head down and drive to the whole point guards, in my opinion. Now, now, 2000- I, was, I was not a huge Derrick Rose guy. i got to be totally honest. I thought wow. he was a little overrated. That is that is scalding hot. Wow, that's nice by you. 2003, number one pick, LeBron James. There's no yes. reason to, you know, you, you would take him if he was from a country you didn't even like. Uh, then you go back to Michael Olawakandi, nineteen ninety eight, went to the LA Clippers. Did he play at like uh, Santa Clara or something no, he's like from that? Pacific, but he's not Pacific. a home guy. He's from England, right? But he was playing at the local college. Like everyone fell in yeah. love with this guy at this little school outside of Los Angeles, and I think that the Clippers fell for him because of the localness. But wait, 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 wait. Let's define. Let's go back here. Is local from college or is local from high school? Because Marvin Bagley's the local Phoenix kid. He went. He's from Phoenix. It could so be is either. that drafting a local kid? Yeah, no. And, but, but no, no. But Mikael Bridges from Villanova, who the 76ers originally drafted, he was a double winner. That's he a double to, local. Like Mar Bagley the third is a high school local for the Phoenix Suns. That's yes. not enough if you're a college because nobody really knows where people went to high school anymore. But then, okay, let's look at here's a good example. Eddie Curry played down in my neighborhood, Thornwood High School on the south side of Chicago. And he was supposed to be this super post player, big as a house. And then I remember reading an article in the Chicago Sun Times, like, you know, should the Bulls draft Eddie Curry? He had zero points the other night and five rebounds in a, in a high school game. He got shut out by the opposing center. And I remember seeing these these articles <laughs> in the Chicago Tribune saying, "Don't take him." And the Bulls had, I think, two top six picks. They took Tyson Chandler, who slowly ended up with a really nice career, and then Eddie Curry, who I think he averaged eighteen points a game one year with the Knicks, but that doesn't count. And he was a bust bust. Well, it's funny because I thought originally Eddie Curry was the better player than Tyson Chandler. Curry yeah. could score. He was a really good scorer. Chandler was more of a defensive guy, and he never got great at offense. Like, Eddie Curry started out, I think his fourth year at the Bulls at age 22. He was averaging 16 and 5, but his, you know, he, this guy's seven foot three hundred and couldn't average eight rebounds a game. That's effort. Did, did you see him in the McDonald's? He had one of the better McDonald's games I've ever seen, by the way. I loved I thought Eddie Curry was the truth. I thought that was the best pick. But you're right. Of course he was a bust bust. Dude, he scored 19.5 points a game one year with the Knicks. How is that possible? <laughs> is this the right player that I'm looking up? I, I know. I, he, had I that, uh, not, he started 81 out, of, uh, 81 out of 82 games, played 35 minutes, averaged 19 and 7. And then all of a sudden he said, oh, I forgot him. Eddie Curry went by, right back to averaging 13.2. And then, then, then he got injured. He averaged 1.7 two years after averaging 19 and a half. So it's funny about Tyson Chandler, too, because that was sort of Jerry Krause's new uh, philosophy. I'm going to go young. He did. It turned out he picked one really good sort of championship piece in Tyson Chandler, but you can't have all 18-year-olds. You know, that's the problem. You need to mix them in with veterans. That's what Phoenix is right now. If you looked at Phoenix's roster, they're all 19-year-olds. They have a bunch of Eddie Currys and Tyson Chandlers, and you can't do that in the NBA. You really can't. I, it, it's exciting, and I think the local fans will like seeing all these 19-year-olds run around and they're energetic. But there's not a good player in the bunch. Devin Booker's a really good offensive player. He's not a good player. That's, too, that's a different thing. Um, here's, here's the thing. We do the bust metric, the Leisureman bust metric, and we usually do it during the NFL draft. Using the NFR Leisureman bust metric, which is, you know, people are talking about in England, people are talking about sure. in Europe, that we've mastered this, this, uh, this metric here. Who is the top 10 draft pick based on whatever reasoning you have that's most likely to be a bust in the 2018 NBA draft? Wow, because so the last I, I was actually should we run through them? Yeah, the last five drafts. By the way, you have to realize 
eight out of ten of the top guys have been bust. The uh, the rule is bust. The exception right. is the guy who's not a bust. Because usually so, people are taking centers and they bust. Right. Some end up being serviceable NBA players that bounce around and get traded. As they become trade bait and remember them. Oh, remember when he was a top ten pick? Yeah, but um, by the way, is D'Angelo Russell a bust? I just want to define bust. Like he scored 20 points a game last year for the Nets or something. But he's a bust, right? He was a number two pick is, for Lakers. He is a bust because of what he didn't do for the team that drafted him. Now, he could okay. salvage his career, though. But I pulled that up for Victor Oladipo the other time. He was off the team that drafted him in three years, and everyone said, no, he's not a bust because he's a star now. So how do you – I'm not sure that there's a clear ruling here on what a bust is, Paulie. And it's really tough with NBA players because they're all 18, 19, so you need three years to let it play out. Even Steph Curry, I think he averaged like 12, 14 you know, yeah. the first couple of years. He wasn't lighting it up yet, and he yeah. definitely wasn't a bust, but he wasn't himself yet. He didn't become Steph Curry until year four. Yeah, let's run down this list and do our bus metric. All right, go ahead, Paul. You okay, start. let's start at the top. DeAndre Ayton, what would be a red flag for him? He's a seven-foot center, and it's the year 2018. That is a giant, waving, gigantic red flag. So you're saying it doesn't matter what he does as a player. The post game is irrelevant, so he's not worthy of the number one pick. I was watching the Celtics Sixers series. The Sixers came in as huge favorites, and Joel Embiid destroyed them in one game. Then I heard Brad Stevens after the game say, yeah, how many threes did he hit on us? And by the way, Embiid destroyed them, and the Celtics won by 20 points. And and Brad Stevens is like, he's just not hurting us. He's just putting in a bunch of twos. Doesn't matter today's game. That's how I see Aiden. Yeah, you know, I got to agree with you because, I mean, even if best-case scenario, let's say he DeAndre Aiden in two years from now is averaging 22 and 12 and, and three blocks. Uh, he's still not hitting any, unless he's hitting a bunch of threes for you and he ends up being a step outside guy like Kevin Garnett or even Kevin Garnett. He didn't, wasn't a three point guy. He was more inside outside guy and he would be less relevant in this NBA. Yeah. Although I got to admit, like the eight and highlights are crazy. He does look like he could be the next Hakeem. So uh, I, I'm a little less nervous about him. All right. Number two, Mar- who do you got? Marvin Bagley, power forward out of Duke. Yeah. I would say the only thing that there's nothing about his game that makes me think he's a bust. Mm-hmm. He plays a lot of hustle from what I saw his first mm-hmm. year at Duke. Um, going to the Kings, you become that's irrelevant. A huge, yeah, you yeah. just become irrelevant really fast. That's the, that is actually that's not even like a bus guideline. That's a bus rule. If the Kings take you, you're a bust. I'm yeah. sorry, that's just the way it is. They it, have a lot of young talented players. It's it almost like the, yeah. it's almost like a, what Dave, happened to David Carr when he got drafted by the Texans. He's going to get roughed up playing for the Kings for three years, and then he'll probably just bounce around from team to team and play some good basketball, and make a lot of money. And that's not against him. I'm not questioning his character. I'm just saying. Playing for the Kings in, in a in a town that doesn't get a lot of press coverage on a team that just sucks, it, it's got to wear on you. Yeah, and he's one of seven, uh, no, I'm sorry, five seven-footers. They got Scal Labrassiere from yep. the Kentucky, who's also a lefty like Bagley. They have Willie Cauley-Stein, who's a seven-footer. They have Costa Kufos from Ohio State, seven-footer. And they have Harry Giles from Duke, seven-two. I don't know what they're doing. They're collecting seven footers in the era you don't need them. Yeah, yeah, they're ready. If 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 all of a sudden there's a, a like a time machine movie where we all go back to 1986, the Kings are ready to rock. All right, yeah. the Atlanta Hawks traded uh, for they took Luka Doncic. They traded him to Dallas. All right, Luka Doncic, guard, Slovenia, 19 years old. Everyone says he's one of the hotter European guys. Here's the bus metric on him: the overrating of European basketball players from year to year in the NBA draft is a tradition like none other. There's we always fall for some Dante Exum, Ricky Rubio, yeah. and this year it's Luka Doncic. And everyone's like, "Well, look at his highlights." Well, when are highlights ever bad? So yeah. it's not about him. And he could be a very nice player. He could average, you know, two years from now he could be averaging thirteen and six. That's mm-hmm. not a star, though. Yeah, I mean Mario Hazonia is the is the clear. Uh, directly comparison to him, but then again, all the uh, all the analysts said that he's better, more accomplished in the European game than all those guys. So we'll see. But it sure seems like our buddy Chris Mannix. Let's face it; he just <laughs> falls in love with overseas players, and I had trouble trusting them. So that's a big bust measure. All right, I'm going to go next one, and I I like this guy because Jaron Jackson Jr. Power forward out of Michigan State, very young. I think he's still 18. He showed he could play inside. Showed he could play outside. The biggest bust metric avoider is being the son of a former NBA player. Do you you agree with that one? Oh, yes. No, No, that's the best thing you can be. A mid-level NBA player is how you become a superstar. That's what what I'm saying is he he takes away a lot of the bust worry because his dad played in the league. Yes. I have almost no worry that he's going to be a bust. 
That's the greatest thing. I totally agree. I'm sorry. I totally agree with you. That's the best thing about him. And you need that mid-level player like Joe Bryan, Kobe Bryant's dad, Del Curry, yes. guys like that. The mid-level player. So he grew up around professional players. Now, he does have the Grizzlies factor. Right now, the Grizzlies are pretty. 